Good morning, Christ Chapel. How are you this morning? Good. Good morning to everyone streaming online. We're so glad that you are tuning in. Uh, for those in Converge, welcome. For those at West Campus, for those at the Hive, for those at South Campus, we love you guys. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15. We're continuing our series in this Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to jump in. We've got uh, 10 verses that we're going to cover, but they are deep and they are rich, uh, and so we're going to dig through. Um, quick fun little fact about me, I desire to be a professional basketball player. That is uh, somewhere in the depth of my heart, and I have given up that desire. Uh, this is free agency season. I have missed no phone calls. No one has attempted to pick me up in free agency, uh, but that's something that I would love to be able to do, to be a professional basketball player, uh, but because I'm not athletic and can't shoot, for some reason they don't, they don't call me. I also would love to be able to cook, and I am a bad cook. I'm good at egos um, for my kids, and that is about the extent of it. I want to be a good cook, and, and that ship hasn't sailed yet, unlike my basketball dream, that has sailed, but, but cooking, my ability to cook hasn't. Here, more seriously, um, I desire, I genuinely desire to be a godly man, to live a life that brings God glory all the days of my life. To be able to look back however many days he gives me and look back out of a response to a father who adopted me when he had no business, when I had no business being adopted by a holy God, and to say, God, did I reflect and respond to the unending grace with a life of godliness? And it's a question that all followers of Christ should, should be asking and ultimately should desire. We should all desire how do we live holy lives, godly lives, God-glorifying lives? And in Matthew 15, where we are, uh, that's exactly what gets answered here. Uh, Jesus steps into that question and answers where holiness comes from. Uh, what makes me holy or what makes me defiled um, on the other end? And how does that change how I love and treat others? And so that's really the preview of where we're going. We're going to jump in and we're going to answer that question of of, of what? What makes me holy? What makes me desired? And then we're going to uh, spend the second half of the sermon really unpacking, well, how? How does that change how I love other people? And right from the jump, we're going to see in, in this uh, chapter, chapter 15, starting in verse 10, we're going to see that inward godliness, uh, inward godliness is not produced from outward actions, that this idea of, of to be godly, for, for my soul, for my heart, to be in line with Christ and God is, is not going to be produced by my outward actions. Let, let me read verses 10 through 14 and read along uh, if you've got your Bibles. He called to the people to him, and he said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. So Jesus comes in in these verses with some pretty, pretty strong language. Uh, we see right off the bat, and we need to define what is this idea of to be defiled, because uh, Jesus introduces this idea that, that what defiles a person, what, what is the opposite of holiness, this, this defiling, um, where does it come from? And really, what defiles us is our sin. We, we see that throughout this passage, that to be defiled is the sin that makes us unclean. It's the sin that makes us unworthy, uh, that ungodliness uh, comes from the defilement, and that's a problem. And Jesus condemns religious procedures as the solution to that sin. The religious procedures that I want to do externally, Jesus looks at those and in this passage says that's not the solution to your sin. Uh, let me give you a little context. One of the things he's referencing here is even the, the 10 verses before this, we see this interaction where the Pharisees, the religious leaders are pretty upset and pretty frustrated and pretty confused um, that followers of Jesus, they're not following these uh, rituals, these Old Testament rituals. One of them, namely, that's discussed here in this passage is this hand washing and, and even the idea of eating food that's clean um, and, and gone through the specific procedures that was uh, demanded throughout the Old Testament. And so here we have this context of these rules, these outward external procedures for their godliness in the day, and they're not doing them. There was a belief that these out, 
outward actions, they're going to produce godliness or holiness, it seems. And Jesus is introducing this really radical reversal of that idea. Right, let me draw this into today. Right? Nothing really has changed. We live in a very image-driven society. Right? Just like 2,000 years ago, we had religious leaders who were very focused and obsessed with what is on the outside. Are they doing the external things? And, and, and do people see them? And is it obvious that they're doing the religious procedures so that they can look the way they're supposed to look, so that they can have the holiness that they're supposed to have, and, and that is still a world we live in. We live in a world that is obsessed with external projection of who we are. Whether we are pretending to follow Christ or not, so much of our world is constantly telling us what you look like on the outside. I mean, we have in entire uh, movements in our culture with social media driven by this idea of, here's what I put out here. My Instagram or my Facebook, my Twitter is this outward expression of, of this is what I want people to see I value. This is what I want people to see. This is what I want people to believe about who I am, how great I am, how successful I am, how good of a dad I am, how, how liked I am, all of those things. We live in a culture that still is obsessed by that. It's an incredibly relevant rebuke. That Jesus says, not just then, but to us today. And, and we see not only does he caution us for these religious procedures, but we also see in verses 12 through 14, he's cautioning us against blind leaders, right? Jesus cautions against following these blind leaders in our life, and the language he uses uh, is, is pretty dramatic. Uh, the Pharisees, um, few people really second guess them. To be born as a, as a Jew, I mean, you were inheriting this, not just faith, you were inheriting a, a heritage, right? It was who you were as a Hebrew. And who you were as a Hebrew, especially in this time, looked up to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones who had it all together. They had the answers. They did the right thing. They set the bar for the rest of us. And so for Jesus to stand there and call them blind guides, um, he's He's getting our attention. He's certainly getting his disciples' attention. He even says that they're not even from God and that God didn't plant them. These aren't from God. They're not speaking on behalf of God. They're going to be uprooted, so don't get stuck on their message. And more so, don't follow them because they're going to lead you into a pit. And part of that condemnation um, is that they're leading people into this pit. But really, a lot of what that pit is is a sense of false security. Right, the, the Pharisees and these religious leaders were, were giving people a list of do's and don'ts. And in that list of do's and don'ts, they were saying, if you enter in this formula, you will receive this prize of godliness. And, and it was a sense of false security. It was a legalism that although maybe felt exhausting at times, it also produced a security of, well, great, I just know I need to punch the boxes. I know I need to do the right things. I need to check this list. And Jesus is saying that's a pit of false security. That's not where godliness comes from. That's not where defiling comes from. It's not an outside-in situation. I appreciate the visual Jesus paints here of, of blind guides as people leading you astray. right? And, and usually blind guides are leading you oftentimes where you want to go or where you think you want to go. Um, what you think you must have, what you must accomplish. Again, in our culture, this is incredibly relevant. But there's all kinds of blind guides. By blind guides, we mean authorities. I can find an authority to affirm whatever lifestyle I want. I can find a guide to, to, to affirm that I am the authority. I can find plenty of other voices in, in our world, in my culture, in our culture, to say, I'm the authority. I get to be God. I set what I want to do. Or I can find authorities that are going to layer me full of religious do's and don'ts. And in doing that, um, it again, it allows me almost a false sense of security. I can compartmentalize God. I can compartmentalize my life and just make sure I'm doing these few steps. And then the rest of my life, I can live with a false sense of assurity and security that I checked those boxes. And Jesus is getting our attention. That's so dangerous. The license of following a blind guide to allow you to just do whatever we want and be our own authority, or the legalism of following a blind guide into a pit of check these boxes and then you get it. 
then that will change your heart. Jesus is getting our attention. That's, that's one of the reasons, too, just to, as a side, even with this pulpit, right, the, the humbling privilege that it really is to get to preach at, at this pulpit, and I know a lot of other great Bible-believing churches in this city who don't stand on on what I have to say. You don't show up to Christ Chapel to hear what Cody has to say or to hear Ben's pithy illustrations as authority. We stand and preach God's word. We're, we're going to just say, this is authority. Not my opinions, not my perspective, not Cody's perspective. Uh, we stand on this as our authority. And have said that and make it clear. And there's, there's a lot of really great churches that do that. And honestly, any church that doesn't find that as their authority, scriptures, their authority, run. Run. The ground is shaky. It's sand. You can't build on that. But Jesus is our guide and our savior, right? He doesn't just leave us with this caution, right? He gives us the true answer of where this defilement comes from, what defiles us. He teaches his disciple that outward actions are the product of the inward heart, that outward actions how I live, how I respond, are the product of that inward heart. Verse 15. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But whatever comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. What Jesus is encouraging is he's encouraging a focus on the heart as the source of our godliness. That's where we have to look. That's where it all springs from. Um, here he, he unpacks this idea of this dirty food that enters our mouth, and he just is using basic biology to explain, hey, you eat something, and it's dirty, and it wasn't washed in the same way, and your hands weren't cleaned in, in, the, in the right appropriate uh, ritual. You're going to eat it. It's going to go into your stomach, and it's going to come out of you. That's what Jesus is saying. It's going to just flush right through you, no pun intended. But, but... What comes out of your mouth, that he is authoritatively telling us that is what comes from the heart, more than unwashed hands, right? The heart, and the heart is, to define that, it's the seat of our affections, right? It's the source of our desires. When he talks about heart, that's what that is. That's the heart, the source for our desires and our affections. And what we see here is that the heart really is a factory, right? It's this factory in all of us. And what we see on the outside of our life, ultimately our lifestyles or our, our godliness or our sin that defiles us, it comes from inside. The good or the bad is produced in the factory that is the human heart. And the heart drives our affections and, and our perspectives and, and really ultimately our worship. And when I say worship, the heart being a factory that produces worship, our hearts are our worship factories, they will worship. And, and I don't just mean Christian songs and worship music. They will worship because that's what they're made to do. If it's college football, they'll worship college football. If it's that girl or that guy, if it's that job, if it's that promotion, we are, we are driven. There is something in us to, to find our satisfaction, to produce adoration for something. But is it the right thing? Is it the right thing? Is it, is it I want me? I want my comfort. I want my desires. I want my kingdom. I want my control. Or is our heart producing worship and love for Christ? That heart and that love for Christ is the source of our godliness. Or the lack of depth, right? The lack of affection for Christ is when my heart is a factory cranking out this list of things that defiles me that we see here in verse 19. And understand this sequence changes everything. Christ Chapel, that sequence changes everything because knowing it's not outside in but inside out means I now know where, where the necessary life change has to start. 
at the beginning, if, if I want to grow to be a godly man, if I want to grow in my godliness, I know where it has to start. A life committed to him and walking with him in obedience, a life abundant that I am ultimately called. If you're in Christ, if, if you're not in Christ, this is what you are called and designed to be in fellowship. That life starts with my love for him. It doesn't earn my love for him. And that's such a key order of sequence. Um, the age-old example that certainly I use and I've heard used a lot is the idea of um, a husband loving his wife. Um, I, we have this thing in our family, in the Fuquay household, uh, called Clutter Patrol. Clutter Patrol is something that I, church, am amazingly good at. I'm not good at a lot of things in the household, but I am good at Clutter Patrol. Clutter Patrol is, uh, we have two boys, and so we have lots of clutter in our house, and man, I'm good. I'm good at it. My wife sends me in, and I will move those things. Oftentimes, we just increase the amount of junk drawers in our house whenever I'm on Clutter Patrol, because I just put more stuff in drawers and close up. But when you walk into the living room, what was all cluttered is gone. And yesterday, um, yesterday, we had a birthday party at our house, my mom's birthday, which was so sweet to get to celebrate her, and so we were hosting it, and there was clutter everywhere, and, and my wife had a lot on her plate. And I had a lot on my plate. There was a lot of things that I, I could have been doing or, or, or wanted to, to do. But I looked at my wife and she said, hey, could you help with some of this clutter? And I, and I, and I did. And I clutter patrolled that house and it was amazing. And we had an awesome party and we honored my mom and it was so sweet. And I picked up all this clutter while my wife is just dominating the rest of our life and our family um, in, in great, amazing ways. But I, I did that not to earn right? Love from my wife. I didn't think, oh man, well, if I clutter patrol, even though there's a million other things I can, can be doing and probably should be doing and things I want to be doing, man, I, I want to. Because I love my wife, because I love her, I want to do those things. And the sequence of those things, I didn't pick up all of our clutter to earn it. I picked it up because there was already affection there, right? It was an outward action, at least on that particular Saturday was love for her that produced the action that I was genuinely glad to help with. Um, for the record, also just to protect from any false idol and pedestal, uh, that is not always my response, right? At times, at times in my marriage, my heart is resentful or, or bitter in some way or selfish, and that's what comes out. Praise God, yesterday, that's not what, what came out. But Christ's principle is clear, it's not outside in transformation. It's inside out. So I want to walk us. I want to walk us really through the rest of this, this sermon by really getting to zoom into this principle and, and apply it deeper and, and really walk us through a good exercise, hopefully um, is going to help illustrate and really make even more personal these 10 verses um, that we're studying and help us go from what defiles us this idea that it is, it is what comes out of us, it's the sin that comes out of us, to really, great, then how do we fix it? How, how do we fix it? The heart is something that I, I can't manipulate with outside forces. I can't push the buttons and then all of a sudden get the heart to be where I want it to be. And so uh, this is this area of dependence as a follower of Christ. And so, so how, right? And so I call it here in your notes, if you got it, a daily exercise, right, of focusing on the heart. But really, um, there are days when it is, it is much more of an hourly exercise for me. Um, and it's something I have to work out um, and build this muscle more often than just a daily exercise. But um, first, the first thing we have to do as believers and followers of Christ is we really figure out how do we apply this principle of inside out is if my heart is the factory, right, the source of my action is massively important, I have to identify and discern what my heart is producing, right? I, I have to be able to identify and honestly identify and discern and look at what is my heart producing if it's this source and this important factory in my life. My daily duty as a believer is to evaluate my heart. Your daily duty, if you are in Christ, is to evaluate your heart. Verse 18, it says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the the heart. So what's coming out of me? What's coming out of my mouth? What's coming out of my actions? What's coming out of my responses? What's being produced in your life? What's produced when somebody cuts you off in traffic? What's produced when somebody gets something that 
You felt like you deserved. Or when you don't get something that you feel entitled to, what comes out of you when that happens? Identify the product of your heart. Where where is that sin? What is that sin in your life? Is there selfishness? Certainly in my heart there is. Me focused, self-centered, my needs, my desires before other people. Is there apathy? The the sin of apathy in light of who God is and, and really in light of what God's called us to be a part of is following Christ um, kind of a, a weekly thing that I do every once in a while? Am I apathetic towards the commission that God has given me, towards the role he's given me? Am I apathetic towards my lost neighbors, coworkers who are far from him? Is there greed coming out of me, coming out of you? Is there jealousy? When someone else succeeds, what does it produce? Is there negativity and criticism? Is there lust? Is there deceit? We look to identify those things as mature believers as a part of the process of turning our heart, this factory, over to the only one who can really transform it. Right? And, and there are two traps often when we, when we go down this road of really honestly um, confessing and evaluating and trying to discern our sin. And one trap is we become fixated and we become honestly paralyzed and, and defeated by the sin that we see. Or the other trap is we just look away and it's just uncomfortable. And the first, the first one, when we get paralyzed, oftentimes we get buried under shame. And when we look at our sin and when, we, when we're honest before the Lord and, and he's gracious to reveal um, things that are coming out of us, uh, we just get defeated. We're like the, we're like the guy in the battle who's, who's losing and he just wants to throw in the towel but we know that God is going to win the war, right? So often we're surprised by our sin. And and oftentimes when I'm surprised by my sin, I'm thinking, man, where did that come from? It's this defeating thing, but then I remember and I realize God is not surprised by my sin. God's salvation, God's ongoing sanctification and maturity in my life, he's not surprised by my sin. He loved me while I was still a sinner and he loves me now. God's grace is that rich. Romans 5 says where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So would we not be paralyzed when we look at our sin and frozen in our tracks? But also, would we not just look away and keep it shallow? Well, I feel like I'm avoiding the big sins and I just don't want to dig any deeper than that. I think I'm doing a pretty good job. And so often we can hear a message or a command like that and we think, ah, I'm doing fine. I really am. I'm doing fine. We compare ourselves to other people. That helps us stay shallow and not have to look hard at our sin. Um, That's like the general who refuses to acknowledge that there's any losses in the battle and is blind to those things. Don't be apathetic. Don't be defeatist also. Identify your sin and utilize Christian community in that. If if you don't know your sin, I'll bet there's somebody sitting really near you who might. (laughs) Right? I'll, I'll bet there's people in your life if you're in Christian community, who might love you enough and know you enough, and if you're genuine to say, hey, will you, will you help me dig up some stuff? What are the blind spots? What am I not seeing? What's coming out of my life in ways that man, I, need to, I need to correct? What's, what defilement is this factory producing? Because I don't want to stay there. And then I look at that, and I take that sin, I take that sin, and then I ask the question, how is Christ more beautiful, more valuable, more satisfying, than the things that I'm chasing over here. I honestly assess my sin and I take it before a God who is good and beautiful and I put those in contrast together. The beauty of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the exact imprint, Hebrews says, of the very nature of God. That's who Christ is. Right? His, his value, 1 Peter 2.24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Am I in awe of the value of Christ, what he's done for me, what he's done for you? Are you in awe of that? The satisfaction of Christ, the psalmist says, better is one day in the courts of God. Better is one day in his court. That king, 
Better one day than thousands elsewhere, Psalm 84 says. Do I value God like that? And so I look at my sin and I look at the beauty and greatness and value and satisfaction that he provides. And, and that question is really an important step. That question to evaluate the beauty and the goodness of God, it's important because I don't want repentance and realigning to just be seeing my sin before I get to that repentance and realignment. I don't want to just see my sin, feel bad about it, and then say, well, I guess i got to drop it. I, I shouldn't be doing the sin, so I should drop it. I, I'm not just doing that. I'm replacing it with something better. I'm not just seeing my sin and feeling bad. I'm seeing my sin and then comparing it to the beauty and the grace and the value and the satisfaction of a holy God who's approachable. And I'm, I'm trading what's costing me for something so valuable. I'm replacing it with something so far greater. Is Christ beautiful to you? Is he beautiful to you? Do you draw near enough to him in Scripture to see who Christ is and the character of God. You sit submitted to the spirit of God, which makes much of Christ. Is he valuable? Is Christ valuable? When you look at how you spend your time and your resources and your talents, you say, God, I want, I want to be a part of your kingdom, your kingdom and making it and making much of it. Used in whatever ways you would choose to use me. Satisfied, all I want is you. With the, next, with the next decade of my life, if God wills that, to be a life where I got to draw near to you, be satisfied with you, satisfied more with Christ than my career, than the approval of others. I want Christ to be magnified in my life. I want him to be magnified in, in my life. I want my life to say, God, less of me and more of you because that's how good you are. And then I, I do that. I, I take my sin and I, I take the, the convictions and the, the shortcomings of what is produced from a, an imperfect heart and I, I dwell on the beauty and the approach, approachability of Christ. And then I repent and realign. Right? Repentance is this idea of turning from those things that defile me. Turning from that sin leaving it behind, fleeing from it. I confess and I walk away. But it's also trading lesser things for greater things. Like we discussed in the story in Matthew 13 where a man comes across a, a treasure in a field and then it says that he goes and he sells everything. He says, enjoy. He sells everything he has so that he can buy that field because he knows everything he has, he would happily sell because what is in that field is better more valuable. We're not just laying down our sin, we're picking up something better, but also here in Matthew 15, that Jesus is asking, he's asking for repentance of personal sin, but he's also suggesting a, a realignment of perspective. And, and so I want us to not miss this, that yes, there is a repentance that's a part of this. Hopefully we all walk out of here and say, okay, Lord, how can I, how can I repent? What, what's, what's being produced internally Externally, what, what can I see and track back to my heart of how, how I'm not valuing and satisfying you? I'm chasing after these other things. But also, it's a whole realignment of how I see other people's sin. Not just how I see my own sin, but how I see others. Let me show you, because the Pharisees see sin and defilement as this outside thing. But Jesus says in verse 19, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And in verse 19, when Jesus gives this list, it reminds me of 1 Corinthians 6, when Paul does a very similar thing. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, he gives us this list of things that defile us and really what it costs us, that sin. He says, or do you not know, in verse 9 of chapter 6, he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There's that list of condemning sins. But then he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Jesus tells his followers that sin is a heart issue, not a hands issue. And then Paul 
lists many of those same sins and then lands on this reminder, but such were some of us. We're in that list. We should see ourselves in that list somewhere. We, we should be discerning enough to say, yeah, there's, there's sin that I can, I can relate to in there and be humbled that we needed and still need heart change just as much as the next sinner. You see, this perspective that Jesus is offering realigns how we see other people, right? It, it means the posture. It means my posture to those in their sin. My primary goal in that, my, my driving goal is for heart change first. Then behavior will follow. It changes my, my driving goal, right? And that's revolutionary. What does that sound like when it's applied? Even to some of those sins in that list. Let me use some of the sins off that list. What this means, what this means is that my primary goal, my driving goal for my, my friends who are gay, who struggle with same-sex attraction, my primary goal is not that they will become straight. My primary goal is that they fall in love with Jesus. That their heart is massively changed by a gracious God who loves them. That's my driving goal and prayer and posture and approach. And then yeah, you fall in love with Jesus. Your lifestyle is going to change as you submit to a God who you trust because he's good and he's adopted you. Drunkard is thrown out here. My primary driving goal to, to my friends who are shackled by alcoholism is not just that they simply become sober. It's that they fall in love with Jesus in deeper and deeper and deeper ways and their hearts transformed by love for Christ and a beauty for Christ and a satisfaction that's available. And then, yes, those behaviors begin to change as a result of a factory that God is revolutionizing to the greedy, to the idolater, to the swindler. Heart change, right? Heart change, inside change, and then, yes, will lead to external change to follow. Driving priorities, we interact with the world around us that we're called to be ambassadors to is would they see Jesus' heart? A heart that stood in front of a woman who was caught in adultery, stood between her and her accusers and said, you can't throw stones. You're not perfect. You don't get to throw stones. And turned to her and said, I don't condemn you. But then in the same setting, said, never do that again. Leave that lifestyle. That lifestyle is sin. It's wrong. Don't return to it. That is the heart of Christ that we are ambassadors called to show. Not focused on the outernal change your behavior, change your behavior, change your behavior. But would you see the heart of Christ? That's the heart of Christ. That's the kindness of God that leads, that led us to repentance. If you're in Christ and if you're not, would you be able to hear through centuries of Oftentimes, Christians getting that backwards. In Scripture, religious leaders getting that backwards and hear the heart of Christ. I love you where you are, but I love you too much to leave you there. Walk out of that. Heart change. We get to be the ambassadors to your family, to the city, to your workplace. But that approach, that approach shook the religious leaders. Right? They heard that and it, it honestly offended them. Right, it offended them. People had devoted their lives to doing the right thing, these religious people. They had been doing the right thing, and it was the right thing. Right? Jesus is not redefining sin. He's not redefining godliness. He's not lowering the bar for holiness one inch. But he's reminding people of the source of that godliness, the source of that sin that defiles us. And I think it shakes many of us still today, right? We, we hear some of that. And we get uncomfortable. Wait a second, I don't know if, I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with, with that phrase or that sentence or that sentiment. And I, I think it's really easy to slip into becoming a, I know for me, who grew up doing the right thing, grew up in church, it's really easy for me to slip into being an accidental Pharisee. One, because I forget the source of change is Christ transforming my heart. And two, because I forget such were some of you. It's not us versus them when we see the list, when we engage with the lost world. It's not them and us. We have the Holy Spirit if you're in Christ. But we get to approach them in the same way that Christ has approached you. And I don't offer my correction or my counsel 
to friends stuck in, in sin, as somebody who's conquered my own sin and I've arrived on my own, I offer to somebody who was killed by my sin. Right, Ephesians 2, I was dead. I had nothing to offer, but was given new life that I didn't self-produce. I was saved by grace, not of works, so that no one gets to boast, Ephesians 2. And let me say one final caution. If you hear this grace, it's by grace and not of works. If you hear that and you hear, oh, I, I must get a pass on my sin, you're not hearing correctly. If you hear that it's a heart issue first, and you hear that and you take that for license to say, well, then I guess I'm just going to keep behaving in this way until my heart changes, then you're not hearing correctly. You're not taking so seriously what God is putting right before you. This isn't heart change and grace first this isn't a, a reason for license. And so the last question then we ask is what boundaries or disciplines might I add to keep my heart focused on Christ? If I have repented and realigned, repented from my sin and realigned from my self-righteousness to a humility of how I see others, how do I create boundaries and disciplines to keep me focused there? And the irony, don't miss it, is not lost on me. We just talked for 30 minutes on it's about the heart. It's about the heart. And now we just took a sharp right turn into boundaries and disciplines and outward things that I should be doing. How does it not con contradict everything we just said? It's because it's motivated by a heart to please him. It's, it's responding to his grace and his gospel. That's where my disciplines come from. That's where my boundaries come from. I, I look at my sin and I look at the beauty and the grace of God. I look at those things and I repent and I turn and I realign. Where do I know where to put those boundaries in place? When I see those two things and when I repent and I, I say ah, whatever it takes so I don't wander back in to that. Whatever it takes, whatever boundary, whatever accountability, whatever discipline I need to stay close to the heart of God, that's where my boundaries, that's where my disciplines come. That's God's invitation to us. That's not only God's invitation to us and to the world around us, that is the muscle we build, not a switch we flip, but the muscle we build to say, God, would my heart stay aligned to you? Let me pray for us. Father, Father, we love you and we are uh, dependent on you, God, for this. Would we hear your words? Would we hear this stern command to blind guides who have added all this legalism and all, all of this outward focused change? Would we repent of that in our own hearts? Be kind and gracious to show us ourselves and what our hearts produce so we might surrender to a grace God, a gracious God who overflows with grace. And also, God, to show the world around us the way that you love them. That you would be magnified in our life. That as they see our life, they wouldn't see people who just have it all together for the sake of our holiness. But they would see godliness and holiness as a response to hearts transformed, God. Be magnified in our lives, Lord, for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.